All right, good evening everyone and welcome to the sixth and final episode of this season's Late Night Conference Show. My name is Wilhelm Huck and I'm your host tonight. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, it's, uh, I look really forward to this, uh, to this evening, not just because it's the last one, but we are joining, joined tonight by uh, DJ Kello uh, and I will introduce him in a second. Uh, um, just to remind you, last month we had uh, Professor Joseph Moran discussing how the cellular metabolism might have been around for, well, since the beginning of life, billions of years ago, and maybe even before that. And he was showing us some very exciting chemistry that was happening on prebiotic Earth that was making some really rather complex soup, but soup with a certain direction of maybe metabolism. That was very exciting chemistry, but today the question is not so much as to what happened on Earth all these billion years ago. The question really is, are we alone in the universe? And the, that big question today, there is nobody else who could answer that question better than our guest uh, this evening, uh, Professor Didier Credo, uh, who discovered already during his PhD at the University of Geneva, the first exoplanet circling a star very, very far away from here. And this was in 1995, and what seemed like an impossibility back then uh, has since become a large research field uh, and indeed thousands of exoplanets have been discovered uh, in the meantime. Uh, many of them even resemble Earth in terms of size, distance to the Sun, um, potential presence of water, so they could very well be habitable. Uh, but before I keep talking, let me properly introduce our guest tonight. Uh, uh, to give you a little bit of a background, uh, Didier studied physics at the University of Geneva uh, and then he uh, stayed there for his PhD in astrophysics and physics as well, famously discovering the first exoplanet, as I mentioned. Uh, now, for somebody who is so well known, his CV is surprisingly short. He spent two years as a postdoc at uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at Caltech, uh, but after that he went back to Geneva and uh, he became well, very rapidly he rose through the ranks, becoming full professor, uh, where he still is a full professor, uh, although he has taken up a uh, full-time position also at the University of Cambridge uh, in 2013, where he is currently professor of physics in the Cavendish Laboratory. Um, you already know that he is the winner of the Nobel Prize for Physics. I'm not going to add many other prizes. Uh, uh, I could add the 2017 Wolf Prize for Physics and the Seckler Prize much longer ago, uh, back in Leiden, uh, uh, very shortly after his PhD. Uh, but I'm sure he can talk more to you about all the work that he has been uh, doing. I should also say he is joining us not today from Cambridge, but actually from Switzerland, uh, where he is because uh, the vaccination uh, scheme in Switzerland is running like clockwork and they're ahead of the uh, of the UK system uh, of course uh, so um, before we start let me remind you that we are looking for interesting questions from you our audience uh, please put them in the chat and I will relay them on to DDA uh, and you can ask about the science you can ask about career advice uh, be sure to put them in the live chat uh, this will be the last chance this season otherwise you have to wait till we are back uh, next year, next well, after the summer, I should say. So with that, we are ready to start. Uh, Didier, the Zoom is yours. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, nice introduction. So I'm trying to share with you this excitement of what we call exoplanet revolutions and to explain to you what has completely changed right now with this perspective and what is new, uh, what is opening uh, the connections with the origin of life. I will not discuss about the life topic, but I will show you the pathway and all uh, astronomy is completely reshuffling the game here right now. So um, uh, to start with, I mean, we should start with the solar system because this is still the reference for most of us for the simple reason that's the only place where we can really go and bring stuff and bring it back. And it's still a very good reference for to compare with the other systems. So this is just a, a very simplistic picture of all the material you have in the solar system, which is big enough to be um, to be detected uh, easily. So these are all what we call asteroids. And of course there are, there are some planets, you see them, but what I would like to, um, um, to emphasize to you is this kind of a green belt that seems to be beyond Neptune, which is a rather um, new findings in the solar system. It belongs to a category of object, which is right now called a trans-Neptunian. And they're all sitting in a kind of a shape that looks like a disc-like. 
uh, what we do see here is the imprint of the formation of the planet. And the reason why there is so many of this green object, which is of the size of 10 meter, 100 meter, one kilometer, few kilometers, the biggest one being Pluto. That's the reason why Pluto has been demoted from the status of a god planet into a just a dwarf planet. And, uh, and it's part of these categories there. So this tells us something about the formation of a planet. So forming a planet seems to be, um, I think there is good vision when you form a planet. And there is, if you go too far away, you don't form the planet anymore. You get stuff, but not a planet anymore. And uh, we don't have any planet closer uh, to Mercury in our solar system. So why is that? Why the solar system is like that? So that's a fascinating story I'm going to tell you. And I'm going to break it apart later on to demonstrate that this story is actually highly incomplete. And that was the shock we had when we started to uh, discover all this planet and other stuff. Let's come back to the solar system. So this is the solar system who it is. And actually, when you look at young stars, you find a kind of a similar shape of the similar size, have a look at the scale here is 50 AU, which is 50 times the, the distance between the Earth and the Sun, that's called astronomical unit, we see here. And when you look at the young object with a beautiful um, a telescope that's called ALMA, which is looking in the millimeter wavelength, the same kind of wavelength you have in your microwave, and you pick up this kind of a thermal emission, it's not very hot, it's 50K just above the absolute zero degree here uh, we're talking about, but it's hot enough to be detected and picked up by this, by this uh, series of antennas. And, uh, and we do see here, it's about the same scale, what we call a protoplanetary disk. So it's a structure, which is in that case made of zillions of tiny particles that we used to call dust, and it's just anything which is um, big enough not to be a gaseous form and, and solid enough to be seen as dust. Uh, and it's within this structure that you are forming planet. You kind of guess there is something going on here. You see the kind of ripple, the kind of little grooves. We don't really know exactly what exactly is happening, but we can guess that on the central um, a kind of groove we have, and it's very likely to be uh, a place when the planet is right now orbiting and grabbing all this material around it. So the interesting story of that is this is, um, the picture we're getting when we start observing young stars. When I say young, is really young. I'm talking about 10 million years here. So it's really young age, according to the astronomers. I remind you that this, the age of the sun, which is considered as a mid-age adult, it's four and a half billion years. And then the sun will, will, will stay like that for the next billion years. And after we start evolving and becoming what's called a giant stars. So, so this is very early on in the story of, of, of the stars. And that at this very early age that the planet is being formed. So in a way, the planet are kind of form at the time of the formation of the star. It comes for free. When you have a planet, when you have a star, you form a planet from what this material is around. So, but how does it work? How do we really build up the planet there? So that's the interesting bit of the, of the story there. So would you understand that? You have to go back uh, to look at the system from a side. So that's another system very famous with the disk it's called Beta Pictoris. And uh, on the top image, look at the size, a bit bigger in that case. You have the stars that we don't see because it's, there is a dark spot on it because it will be too bright. And that's what we see with the Hubble Space Telescope. We see this disk from a side. It's extremely thin. We do see here what's called the reflections, like the, the light from the moon. So the sun is reflecting uh, on the moon. It's exactly the same. It's all this famous dust I was talking about that you see reflecting here. And this dust is very thin, very tiny. You get it from the, from the picture. At the very same scale on the bottom, you have the same target, but observed in a very different wavelength, which is the same system used before, picking up that time the gas, the CO gas. And what you see is the gas has a very different structure, is where thicker in vertical sense, and it seems to be truncated. The reason why it's thicker is because of the law of physics. As soon as you have a gas, you have pressure, when you have pressure, there is something, something that's sustained. It's called the hydrostatic equilibrium. And that's why you can go to the mountain and still breathe. If you don't go high, you still have oxygen on the top of the mountain. But when you drop a stone from the tip of a mountain, you will just fall, fall apart. The gas will stay and under balance. And that's what you see here. But what you do also notice is this truncation tell us something about the nature of the gas. The reason why it's truncated is very simple. Because when you get close to the star, it's very hot. When you go farther away, it cools down, there's less radiation. It's like it's hotter to go on Mercury than to go on the Earth and get closer, get, get cooler when you go to Mars and so on. And 
there is a point which, which is cold enough then the gas cannot remain gaseous form. I mean, there is a phase transition and the gas is becoming a solid. So the gas become dust in a way, or if this is water, this is becoming snow. And, and that phase transition is critical because then as soon as it does not anymore is behaving as a gas, it's not sustained as a gas and it's fall on the disc. And the disc is so thin. So you have tons of material falling apart on the disc. It's like uh, uh, going shopping on the Christmas on the Christmas days. Everybody is bumping to each other. That's exactly what's going to happen on the disc, but it happens only when you are far enough. That is why you form the big planet far enough because there's so much material bumping into each other very early on because of this mechanism that you create the core and the core is big enough to trap all the gas around. It takes way longer to happen on the center. You don't have this mechanism. You have to rely on any material which is not in gaseous form that is kind of a silicate form or all this kind of stuff you have uh, on the sand beach. And it takes much more longer. This is why everybody is expecting a planet, a big planet farther out. So using the techniques to find planet, essentially two very simple way. I just briefly just run to, to remind you of how we do that. We don't really look at the planet. We just sense the planet by looking at the stars. When there's a planet orbiting the star, it's moving the location of the star on the center of gravity of the system. If you're lucky, you can see the planet going in front of the stars. Otherwise you can pick this motion. This motion, we use the radial velocity with the Doppler shift to detect it. That's how we made the first discovery. So this technique is not very sensitive to planet on short period. And that's the reason why people were very suspicious using these techniques to look for planets because it takes a long time to find a Jupiter. But the big surprise is there are planets where you don't expect it. So after 30 years, uh, if I try to summarize what we know, this is this famous diagram that is the overall picture, family picture of all the planetary system we found so far. Uh, when you set the period of the planetary system on the bottom in the days, and uh, you have then two ways to look at the planet. Either you know the size and you get the radius. This is what you come get from the transit or you get the mass. The mass is come from the, from the Doppler shift. Some objects have both radius and a mass because we can detect with both ways. But what I would like to mention here is this is the picture picture we have on all the system on very simple parameter. You notice the location of Jupiter and the Earth and Venus. So it's pretty alone here. And there's a good reason why there is no other planet found there because this is a sensitivity, um, sorry, it's there, uh, the sensitivity of the techniques. Anything which is on the left side can be detected. Anything on the right side, we are invisible. It is too difficult to do. So transit cannot pick up system which is farther away than the Earth, a few, um, and because they don't have enough sensitivity and you can barely detect on Earth. And, and the, the mass is exactly the same. Well, you can still detect enough size if the period is shorter because you have a lot, a lot of data. And that's also valid in the case uh, of the Earth mass at shorter periods. So the big shock of this, of this diagram is everybody is expecting to detect a Jupiter when they were starting. And what they found is all this bunch of objects here that is called hot Jupiter, which is big object of the size of Jupiter, but much smaller period, a couple of days or a couple of mass, similar mass than Jupiter, but also a couple of days. That was a big surprise because what people completely forgot in this nice modeling I mentioned to you is you can indeed form a planet farther away, but it doesn't mean the planet will stay where they are. So planet can move around and actually there is plenty of good reason for planet to move. One of them, and when you form a planet, there is still the disk around and the disk interact with the planet. It's a bit like if you want to move your finger into a, a, a pot of honey, so the honey will react against your move. <laughs> so it's exactly the same. So there's interaction between, between the mass of the disk and the planet, and you can compute the interaction. And one of the outcome of the interaction is to move along and to migrate in and migrate out the position of the planet. If you have many planets at the same time, they also interact and they can move around. And if you have another stars around, like in most of the case, there are other stars, part of binary systems. It also can affect the location of the planet. So, so there's plenty of good reason, but nobody had considered this as a possibility. This is why it was a shock when we announced the first one. And we can even more shocking when we started to detect plenty more. So what you see is we've not only detected 
this this population of strange hot Jupiter. Well, of course we have find we found also real Jupiter. They are there, but there is plenty of other objects we have found that are not supposed really to exist here. We also detected planet much bigger than we thought. Not only the mass of Jupiter, but two times, three times, five times, ten times. What do we set? What do we stop? It's not very clear. We know that we reach 80 times the mass of Jupiter. We start to ignite the, the planet in a way because the pressure is good enough to start the thermonuclear reaction. So certainly it set the upper boundary, but there is a regime that we call brown dwarf, which is below this regime when you start to be a stars. When we do believe there is a kind of a stars which is, is not big enough to radiate and to be visible. So there is this big surprise. Where do we stop here? And then the really big surprise is this population of object that is sitting between the Earth and even below the Earth up to super uh, Neptune. And but the, the surprising fact is not that there are only this kind of object that doesn't exist in the solar system in this kind of mass and, and radius regime, but they are on a very short period. Essentially, all these objects are within, would sit within the orbit of Mercury. And that was a big surprise. If you try to look at the occurrence of each of these categories of planet, it's even more surprising. You find that the hot Jupiters are very kind of rare and a few percent, so it's very extreme cases. They happen to, to experience a very dramatic event. That's the reason why they are where they are. We have about 10% or 10, 20% of object that looks kind of like Jupiter. It's good news. It seems that we may have system a bit like our own system, kind of, but the big surprise is more than half of the stars more than half of the stars, they have planets which are really bizarre. They are really not, they have no counterpart in the solar system. And the conclusion of this work of 30 years of research by most of the team around the world is the solar system is not the standard system that explain the planetary systems. It's one of them, but it's not the standard systems. The more likely system you're going to form are this category, which is, a planet that could have the mass on the size of the Earth or be bigger or like Neptune, but very close. It means quite hot. And that is the big surprise of the, of the field. Now, what we have done is trying to understand what we're talking about. What kind of planet are we talking about here? Now, to do that, we need to combine two data sets, the mass and the size of the, of the, of the planets. And again, you can find again our friends, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune here. And this is all the data point you have is all the real measurements that are real data we have on the, on the planet that we detected on other stars. These are the diversity of the planetary system. So we do see that we have a significant amount of object that would qualify at Jupiter. Not exactly, they seems to be a bit bigger. They are what we call inflated. The reason why they're inflated is most of the system are in short periods, as we've understood. This is, we have a lot of detection there. So it seems that the fact they are so close to the star has an effect on the planet and make it a bit bigger. Uh, but then what happened is we use the, model, the modeling of the, of the Jupiter, the way it is made, and we try to take a Jupiter and remove a bit of mass. You're moving along this line, here's gray line. So when you take Jupiter and start removing mass, you will meet Saturn, which is very similar to Jupiter. And you reach, we will reach the mass of Neptune here, but you will not get the size of Neptune. So if you take Jupiter, you remove the mass up to get the mass of Neptune, it will be bigger. The reason why is because Neptune has much more heavy element inside, is much bigger, bigger core, and, and, uh, hydro, and Jupiter and Saturn are full of hydrogen and helium. Why? There is very little hydrogen and helium on this planet. There is much more CO and, and methane, so all these gas that are slightly more heavy. So that's why the planet is a bit more compact here. And it lies into a regime that it's kind of an artificial planet that if you imagine a planet full of water, you would lie along this line. It's a way to explain the planet made of gas, that the gas could become a bit more solid inside, uh, but has a different nature that hydrogen and helium. And that's, it tell you a bit the kind of nature of this, of this planet. I'm not telling they are in, in, by, in made in water, but they look a bit along this line. But what I would like also to mention here is when you compare all this planet with the Earth that would be lying onto this green line, this is one Earth mass, one Earth radius. So same trick, in that case, you add mass on the Earth, you use the same structure. So you will be moving along this line. And the good news is we have found kind of super Earth, really super Earth. It means object that seems to have the, let's say up to 10 times the mass of the Earth and that do have a corresponding size that is matching the Earth density. So essentially, the diversity of the planet we are encountering here in this regime, which is between few Earth mass and let's say 10-ish 
Earth mass is uh, extremely diverse in terms of structure. You can meet planet that looks like a rocky planet in a way, rocky planet without significant atmosphere, with way more atmosphere, a planet that is full of atmospheric, and then until you reach an even planet that seems to be like Jupiter and Saturn. So it's an immense diversity that nobody had imagined before. And uh, if you want to have a pretty picture of what we understand right now, the diversity of the planet. So on the solar system, you have the Earth, you have the ice giants, Neptune and uh, Uranus, you have Jupiter and Saturn, it's essentially full of hydrogen. Well, actually, no, we know it's a bit more complicated than that. You can have objects in between. So it means maybe you have massive core uh, and then it changes a bit the structure. It makes the planet a bit more compact is because the gravity is higher here. Or you can have all what you can think about between the Earth and the ice giants. You can bring the Earth and make it bigger. So it's Earth with a very big core. You can have uh, a core like the Earth, but a very thick atmosphere, what's called ocean planet. When I say thick, I, I really mean it. It means 1,000 kilometers of water. So the water on the top is not exactly the same nature and, and phase, um, phase <laughs> that the, the water there here, you can guess, is a big gradient of density and temperature here going on. Um, then uh, you can imagine you have a core, but then you have no water at all, just gas and like hydrogen, or you have a mixing. You can mix something like the, the Neptunes. And, and we are facing you know, this amazing diversity and trying to understand a little bit what we're talking about. Good news is we're going to tell you what we are dealing with pretty quick. Because when we have a transit, we can learn way more than just the size and then the mass if you get the dynamical detection of it. How do you do that? Well, you use a transit light curve. This is a transit light curve. You observe a star with a planet and you have the time when the star is going in front of the, of the, sorry, the planet goes in front of the stars. It creates this transit, boom, a little bit of a decrease of flux. You have the time when the planet is behind the star. So it's a very special time called secondary eclipse. So if you think about the zoom here, if you think about this very special location here, is actually the only moment when you only see the planet, sorry, the star, because the planet is behind. So that's the only moment when you only look at the star so the flux of the star rise up to that point because that's the only moment you have it. All the rest, which is above it, is actually due to the planet. So it's a bit similar than the phase function of the moon. You have here the phase function of the planet. When the planet is there, we see the dark side. When the planet is there, we see the bright side. And from this kind of functions, we can derive the nature of the planet. We don't need the planet to have an atmosphere. We can derive the surface of the planet by observing a different kind of color or spectroscopy. We can say something about the planet. We can even see if you have high resolution, some motion into the atmosphere. We can global motion into the, the atmosphere. Well, we can learn quite a lot about what the atmosphere is doing. And we can certainly know whether there is or there is no atmosphere that we are, we are detecting. Now, the interesting element, you can also use the transit to tell us what it is about. And I will show you a very simple example. This is ISS uh, picture of the transit of the moon on the earth, just to help you to understand. What you do see here is the atmosphere, this Rayleigh scattering, the reason why the sky is blue, it's about 20 kilometer height and that you see here. Now let's imagine I don't observe that in the visible, but I observe the infrared. Then I go through the atmosphere, I do like a spy satellite, I'm spying on what's going on on the ground. Well, I would see a much smaller planet because I don't see the atmosphere anymore. So I see the planet minus 20 kilometers here because I don't see anymore the, the atmosphere at all. Now, I want to see the most extended atmosphere possible. I want to see the 50 kilometer height, which is the ozone layer. Well, I just use a wavelength that is uh, responding to the ozone, um, I think emission, I mean, ozone line, and I would pick up that wave. So you understand by this picture, that depending on the wavelength I'm observing a transit, I don't see the same size of the planet. Well, I can do what's called a retrieval. I can reverse the physics and I can ask myself, what is the atmosphere layer that I need to test to reproduce my observations? And that's how you can combine this thermal emission that I mentioned before that you get from the transit phase functions with a direct transit spectroscopy, that's what we call it, that does a kind of an X-ray on the atmosphere of the planet. And of course, the holy grail will be to make a picture, a direct picture of the planet. It's still a bit 
at the edge of what we can do, but the, there is a new generation of, of telescope, gigantic telescope that will be doing that to help supporting. So I hope I convince you that soon we will be able to tell quite a lot about what are made this planet. So I would like to end with uh, discussing a little bit this picture because it's entering into the territory of life. So, so far we have this kind of broad definition of the minimum condition for life, which is we need liquid water. I think everybody can to agree Liquid water is a minimum condition. So this use of the liquid water as a criteria define what we call the habitable zone. It doesn't mean there is life. It just means that we can define a region of the orbit where it works. Well, the implicit assumption that, of course, it depends on the atmosphere. Because if you put water on the planet and there is no atmosphere, the water will vanish. This is exactly what's going on on Mars. This is why there is no water, liquid water on Mars. So it's a little bit of a criteria to take uh, with some, uh, with a good, with a good understanding the, on the assumption. So the, the the usual assumption is the planet has a similar atmosphere than the Earth. You can twist a little bit the composition, so you can twist a little bit the boundary. But that defines a closer boundary, which is about Venus in the case of the Earth, and about a bit beyond Mars. So depending on the assumption, you can move a little bit, but that defines the habitable zone. So luckily, it works for the Earth, and that's the reason why we are habitable to water. Now, what you could do here. Uh, is you can test this habitable water with all the planets we have found. And then we have a problem because most of the planets I described to you are there. They are way too close. They are in an orbit where it's clearly they have no chance you have any water that would survive. There's no way. Even if you have a, a rocky planet, it doesn't work. But we're using a trick. In astronomy, we have so many stars. So we have so many options. Just look at stars that doesn't look like the sun, but slightly smaller. That's what I'm doing here. I'm decreasing the mass on the size of the stars. By doing that, the stars doesn't shine the same way. It becomes cooler and cooler and cooler. But to get the same amount of flux that I'm getting on the Earth, what should I do? I should get closer. So it's like a fire. If you decrease the fire, you have to get closer if you get to, to feel the same heat. That's the reason why this habitable zone is moving closer here. And that's the reason why people is excited. That's why you're hearing that we are detecting today planet in the habitable zone, because this population of object I was describing to you, they also is being observed. It's also being observed on smaller stars. In that case, a lot of the system which have a density like the Earth are within this regime. This is why we're so excited right now. And we saw we have planet there that technically speaking could mean having water. No, the big open question is we should look for life. And that's a complete new territory. This is why I, I start talking and working with other people that are beyond my usual field, trying to understand what it means. But already the message, the short message to, to remember is we have potentially a zillions of planets that technically could develop life. No, we just have to demonstrate that indeed there is life being uh, developed on this planet. And that will be a story for another time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Didier. That is a fascinating story. And um, well, we're not going to say, well, we're going to talk about life another time. We will do that at some point, I hope. Uh, but first, we need to discuss uh, your presentation, of course. Uh, it's a fascinating story. Um, um, I was thinking, I, I feel very humbled as a chemist. We, we can only build with molecules, and you are building planets and stars. And, and, and that is quite a different scale. So, so it's, it's a really sort of, well, it's kind of an eye opener that you can build stars and sun. And, and you say it all comes out of dust. Um, and you show us the different mechanisms a little bit and sort of the different types of planets that you can form. And I was especially thinking, you talk about planets. I, I generally think about a planet like, like Mars and it's just a rock. And well, I know that there's also some ice planets or maybe gas planets, but it's for me, it's, yeah, it's not so much diversity. Whereas for you, it seems like there's a whole zoo of different planets with their own characteristics almost. Almost like you're talking about the animal kingdom. You're talking about the planet kingdom. There's so many different ones out there. And, and, and one of the things I was thinking, for example, these planets, are they born that way? So are you born a gas giant and you will be a gas giant forever? Or is there also during their life that lifetime that they evolve further into different flavors? Uh, or do, do you not look at it like that? Uh, yeah, I think this is a very good question. Actually, it depends on the kind of planet you're talking about. 
Well, when you're talking about giant planet, um, you don't have much option because actually they, when they build, they are grabbing all what they can around and there is not much stuff you can do. You can still be dumping object into a, a planet like Jupiter, but look, Jupiter is 300 times the mass of the Earth. Even if you dump an Earth into Jupiter, you will barely see it. It would just, Jupiter will digest <laughs> the Earth and that's it. It would just rise a little bit, the amount of heavy element that would be negligible. So these giant planets are really for us what we call um, um, use as a time stamp of the telling us the story of the origin of the system. That's why we love system with Jupiter, because turning this Jupiter telling us a lot about what you have at that time you form the systems. And all these disks, they don't have to be exactly the same, because uh, depending on the amount of the evolution you have had in the galaxies, remember, Anything you get in chemistry, or if you don't deal with the, uh, if you put aside the hydrogen and the helium, and, and all the rest is made into the star, or once you have the big, the uh, explosion of the supernova. So everything is reprocessed by the, by the stellar physics. So depending when you sit into the galaxy, you may have matter, which is heavily reprocessed compared to matter, which is mildly reprocessed. So the amount of material you have can be pretty different. So we expect to have different story happening for the planetary formation, depending on the formation location when it happened. Now, for smaller planet is way more critical because we have seen that on Earth. Earth is a very good example. Uh, is we know that the moon has been formed at the very early stage after the formation on Earth. Well, technically what happened, you started to form the Earth and about 50 million years after you have the Earth, which is quite still hot, but still there, bang, massive impact from a massive impactor, so big that it took apart part of the matter from out of the Earth. And this matter kept going around the Earth and, and at the end managed to agglomerate together uh, just by the natural agglomeration and the gravity, law of gravity, and end up to be the Moon. And this hypothesis has been tested. The time we brought back stuff from the moon, we realized that the rock of the moon are strictly speaking the same. It's a copy pass of the same material you have inside the crust, uh, inside, the, uh, inside the earth. So this is what can happen. Then it's not enough. In the case of the earth, we had a primary atmosphere early on, but its atmosphere has evolved and of plenty of way. First, it has evolved because a lot of material has been falling on the earth. Then after, because the Earth started to cool down, there is a regime when you start to cool down enough to start the plate tectonic, the, the circulation mechanism, the volcanic tectonic activity. So part of the stuff that went down because it was much more heavy and fall down when it was liquid, well, started to appear outside again because this is what the volcano is doing. The volcano is bringing stuff from the inside outside in the atmosphere. And then the atmosphere has changed and we have had a new atmosphere starting to build up, let's call it a secondary atmosphere. And then the life started to kick start and the life had something to say and slowly the life started to impact on the atmosphere and on and on and on. Venus, which is almost a similar planet than the Earth, they have the same mass, the same size, is drastically different. So that's why we are so fascinated by Venus and we are very pleased to hear that there will be two space missions going to understand Venus a bit better because Venus may show us what is the future of the Earth if you keep messing up with the global warming. It's exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> I don't want to scare you. There's still a long way to go. I... But since we seem to be very efficient, like messing up stuff, this is what can happen. And there are a lot of plenty of other stuff that can happen to change the atmosphere of the Earth. <laughs> I think in the Dutch, uh, on the Dutch news, they called it a, a, a visit to the hellish planet. Uh, so that's, that's not a good future for us, I think. Uh, um, Oliver McGuire had a question uh, and he uh, asked, uh, does the type of planet you observe vary with the, star, with the type of star it orbits? Uh, yes, it does, actually. This is a very good question. And there is a good, very good reason for that. There is a connection between the size and the amount of material you have uh, in the disk when you form the planet and the mass you have into the star. Well, to make it simple, when you have a big star, a star bigger than the sun, well, you happen to have more material around. So it seems that when you have a bigger star, the chance to form a bigger planet 
like Jupiter or Saturn is higher. And we've seen that when we're looking for smaller stars, it means smaller, we start talking about the uh, star which is 10 times less massive than the, um, than the, um, than the sun. Well, the expectation is, th is the disk will be also 10 times less massive. And in that case, there is clearly not enough material to make a planet as big as Jupiter. But it seems to have plenty enough material to make a planet like the Earth. And we, again, remember, the Earth is 300 times less massive than, than, than Jupiter. So forming big planets like Jupiter seems to require some kind of big stars. And it may have an impact on life because people keep arguing that Jupiter had a very special role in the solar system. Jupiter is protecting us quite a lot as acting as a shield from the cometary impact because the cometary impact will be deviated by Jupiter and will be usually when they are deviated, they are getting out of the plan of the, uh, of the ecliptic. So most of the planets are on the same plan. So as soon as you have one planet, which is massive enough to, to push a bit outside, uh, outside the track, uh, any any falling object, then it's deviated and it will not it will not impact the Earth. So the Jupiter is helping us a lot. Otherwise, we'd have way more impact falling hmm. on Earth. Thank you. Um, I have another question from Pascal Huizing, who would like to hear your take on the controversial phosphine paper. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, you, you, you know immediately what we are referring <laughs> to. Uh, uh, could it be a sign of life? I think uh, we have had this uh, sort of little bit of this discussion on one of the earlier episodes, but I think you are much more of an expert to comment on this. Yeah, there, there's different way to see that. Well, I think first, and on the global way, um, I think it's very interesting to use this approach. It shows a little bit how we're going to approach the problem. We're going to look at some specific molecule into the atmosphere, trying to find out uh, what it means. So I think I like the idea. I like the idea of using that kind of techniques. And that's very likely to be a pioneering approach that we're going to repeat on many other planets later on. Well, unfortunately, in that case, we know that the data um, was mishandled in a way because um, they have been using a techniques which is based on combining different antennas. This is called interferometry. And, uh, and the difficulty to do interferometric measurements with Venus is Venus is a very big object. It's not an object you, what's called unresolved. It's an object that is resolved. It's one arc minute on the sky. So it's really big. So when you, when you do that, actually it, it's a complete another way to analyze the data and you create, because of the fact there is a structure, ripples into the data. And what happened is the people that have analyzed this, well, they were aware of that, but they were a bit too optimistic in the way they could treat these ripples. And actually, everybody understood that the chance that any of these ripples to be a real molecule feature uh, and not just a side effect, a side lobe effect of the interferometric measurements was 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 just a bit on the edge. And what happened is, uh, because you detect in one wavelength, you would expect to see it another wavelength as well. And people have been trying to use other wavelength, other approach that are less prone to this specific difficulty, and they have not found the phosphine, unfortunately. And I do regret because I was just in love of that story of phosphine and and life into Venus. But I'm afraid the data doesn't tell us that there is phosphine at all into Venus. So sorry to be the, <laughs> the killer of the life. Well, you know, maybe there is life on the, under the soil because uh, we, know, we don't know. So Venus but it's, is a good bet. <laughs> it could be life under the soil, but it is not emitting phosphine. Uh, that's uh, for sure. Uh, so that's, uh, but, but I love the story. I thought it was a great story. <laughs> very good. That's, I think um, I may be for everyone. I think that's how science uh, works and is supposed to work, right? You, you measure things, so you might interpret it. It might be wrong and people will tell you and well, then you still learn something, I think, and you, you do it better next time. Uh, so that's that's perfectly all right, I think. Uh, yeah, um, I there is another question from a person called Paul 0011. Um, on Earth, it seems that volcanism was important for life to kick off. Yeah. Could we detect the traces of volcanism on exoplanets soon, you think? Yeah, uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, actually, the, there is a couple of predictions uh, that people are, are making. So it all depends essentially on the amount of the volcanics you're talking about. So it's, it's, there is a tiny bit. It's unlikely you will see anything. But um, there is a, this element that seems to demonstrate that in the past of the Earth, we had massive volcanism activity for 
some period of time. So in that case, I mean, we, we usually, usually people are mentioning Yellowstone as a perfect example. The Yellowstone, if you imagine the whole Yellowstone area, which is big, I think maybe something like 50 to 80 kilometers is a massive volcano. So if Yellowstone start to, I mean, it is a kind of a volcano, but that's kind of a kind of sleeping-ish. It's not really sleeping when you go there, but you realize if this start up as a real active volcanic activity, that would create quite a lot of visible effect. And that's not a good sign for us, by the way, because it's not really something that we're looking forward. But if you could imagine massive volcanic activity, I think there is a chance that we can detect some molecule. I mean, SO3, that would be the obvious molecule that people would like to look at, but there may be others, plenty of others. But you need a significant episode of volcanic activity to be detectable. And so in that case, you would detect it by using your orbital phase plots and the, the sort of the yeah. alignment of the planet and the, and the star? Yeah, yeah, you would detect in the atmosphere of the planet. So which technique you use, whatever. Anyway, later on, we will have bigger, bigger, bigger telescope. We may, be able, we may be able to see the planet directly and to, to get the and uh, remotely analyze. It's a bit like the weather, uh, uh, I mean, satellite. So of course, we'll not resolve the planet, but we will be able to get to get all the flux coming for the planet and we even see the rotation of the planet and it's just a matter there is no you don't break any physical law it's just building the equipment and yeah. being able to do that it just takes a little bit of technology but it we would be able to know it to do it right now it's feasible the problem is way too much expensive right now uh, but we just have to wait a little bit maybe new technology new development new material uh, the fact that the space launch i mean access to space is way easier so all this is going in the right direction. And sooner or later, we may have a moon base with a gigantic telescope on the moon. And then it's going to do that. It's not something which is completely crazy because we're talking about the moon base right, right now. So it will happen. Uh, I'll come back to that uh, point a little bit later on because we have another. Well, I think that's a very, very fascinating, uh, fascinating development. Uh, uh, but there's a question from Anna F. And she would like to know, is there a possibility that water is not necessary for extraterrestrial life? What should we imagine this life to look like? OK, so, I mean, it's more a question for chemists. And if mm -hmm. I remove the water, what do they do? My understanding is not very much. <laughs> but, but you can imagine other liquid that being used. You need some liquid anyway. Now, my take on that is very simple. I see that from the physicist's perspective. Well, um, I can point any telescope, any radio telescope in any location in, in, the, in the galaxy uh, to look for molecular clouds and, and, and protoplanetary disks. I see tons of the water. And there is good reason why there is tons of water, because water is based on element, which is very, very common. First is hydrogen. Hydrogen is, is, is the universe, essentially. It's full of hydrogen. And oxygen is one of the first elements being processed by the stars. So oxygen, I mean, it's like the same for carbon. I mean, carbon, oxygen, there is plenty. You see plenty of them. You point a radio telescope, you have a long chain of carbon, you see water everywhere. So I think water, even if you don't want it, you get it. So you will get water. Now the question is, how long are you going to get it? And Mars had it for about a couple of billion years, at least on the surface. There may be still a lot of water inside. I'm sure Venus have plenty of water inside. We just don't see it because as soon as it comes on the surface, then it vaporizes, but there's still water there. So I think the water is not an issue. I would not be obsessed by the water. It comes almost for free. So, yeah, I think it's a, it's a very good answer in a way that I think also we chemists, I think, should especially think about life as we know it in a way in, a, in an aqueous environment rather than already trying to think of life that doesn't contain water when we actually don't really understand how life works when, when, when it is in water. Uh, so there's plenty yeah. of things to, to learn there. Uh, um, Sam has a question, uh, and the question is, do we know anything about the probability of exoplanets in the habitable zone containing water? Well, I think you answered that question, uh, although um, the question is, on Earth it is thought to have come from asteroids. What are the chances of such an event occurring? Well, it's not very clear on Earth. I mean, we, and the, the problem of the origin of water, it's uh, you can trace back some kind of water if it comes very far away from the solar system. There is a region it's called the Oort, uh, uh, clouds uh, from from the Dutch famous Dutch yes. astronomers. He, he predicted it, and it has. It's still not seen. We're looking for direct detections, but there is a lot of evidence. There is a lot of big commentary 
falling with full of water. So there's clearly some water coming there, but we cannot exclude that there has been quite a substantial amount of water at the time you formed the planet. This water was stored in the rocks, so a lot have just gone because of the, the heat. But there may have been quite significant amount of water still that is coming from the rock itself. So there is a mixture. It's also also the material that is falling from not that far away, from, from closer region. Then in that case, there would not be a very different water in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of isotopes. So, so the, the question of the isotopic water is not clear cut right now. Nobody can say, oh, the water of the ocean is coming from the Earth clouds. This is certainly wrong. And nobody can say, well, we can discard the amount of water coming from the inside. I think it must have been a mix up of the two at the end that is making the ocean. So the question is whether you would have enough water to kickstart life without in fall. And anyway, I don't really care about this question for the simple reason that you get the stuff for free as well. When you form a system with so much material, you have this shower of material coming. So again, you should not be worried. Even if you don't want it, you have it. And I think the dinosaur remember the story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so well, it also means that uh, so in all the mechanisms where you form the different planets, you don't have to essentially start with with lots of water on there. You will eventually get it. Uh, yeah. So absolutely. that's a good point. Uh, um, I was coming back to your uh, to your comment where you said, "Well, soon we well soon uh, sooner or later we will have a base on the moon from which we have even better uh, methods and telescopes to 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 look at distant stars." And I thought that that is quite a change, I guess, also for you in a way, because in 1995 you were able to almost single-handedly. Um, discover an exoplanet and now you say well actually the next PhD student first needs to make sure that there's enough stars aligned and billions of dollars being made available for a machine to be put on the moon to be able to measure. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, that, okay let me answer that this is the beauty of science I think you may see that and I tell you another story in the 90s when we were doing this starting this experiment Nobody was considering that. The big shock, the big funding of the NASA was talking about building a gigantic interferometer, trying to detect the motion of the star by astrometry, how to build a direct imaging missions. Nobody was considering that this kind of technology would win. And, and they were just thinking the big stuff because it's always, I mean, you want to already try to project yourself and, and this is the easy path. So what I'm telling you is the easy path. Now, I'm really hoping that young people with fresh idea will come with maybe awkward way to thinking the way and they will and they sure they will this is the beauty of the new fields they will and they will come up with something new and this phosphine is a good example well it turns out to be wrong but they're using common i mean common science tools to do that they just had a great idea they say oh maybe we should look at something it was there Anybody could have looked and point on telescope to look at that before. So it's just not only having the money and building the big stuff. I think there is still room for maneuver into science for creativity. And um, I would always say, I mean, I can predict the big stuff, but it turns out to have along the way people with way more clever idea that comes an awkward approach and then it's completely breaking the system. And then we have a new way of thinking. This is what science works and it's what science do. And um, even if I would love the idea to have the moon on the base, uh, the moon base, I'm pretty sure some people could come with very clever ideas uh, how to better use the facility we have now on the ground. And there are people working on that right now, I know. How do you, because this takes decades, I guess, to, to, to build. Uh, so how do you keep enthusiastic about a, a project that takes really literally decades to, to come to fruition, or maybe it will come to fruition after you retire? So, so how does that work in the astronomer's field? Because, again, I'm, I'm talking here as a chemist where on Friday afternoon I can run into the lab and quickly try a couple of things which admittedly are not of the same scale as discovering planets but it is a very different dynamic yeah i i, I think i think i i believe the way i see that is i know some of my work is is useful so will be useful for future generations of scientists i'm not talking only about the first discovery i think they've been doing a lot of stuff that's maybe not as glossy and as visible than the first discoveries but People are using that. I mean, there is a build up and I have been using myself also the work of other people. So this feeling of the of the part of a time scale of the global effort 
I just love it. I think this is this makes a lot of sense for my life. I feel that I can do something. I do something useful, uh, not only working on the family scale and the kid scale, and also in terms of society scale. So I love that, and I I I try to use myself as being a useful contributions. Uh, to my to my very limited amount of time uh, on earth so uh, this is the way i see it and i feel great joy about that and, and there's nothing more exciting and happy happy when i see a phd student which is which is successfully doing something or, or a student starting doing something or i'm helping a postdoc some supporting projects so or i know the privilege of the age in a way is is i can push a bit the big stuff uh, but I also have to admit that all the stuff I'm pushing is very unlikely. I will see the outcome, but that's okay. That's part of the game. <laughs> so I feel very happy. I, look, I I feel uh, in an extraordinary. I'm living an extraordinary life, and even if a lot of stuff I'm doing, I will never see the end of it. Um, I think it's already great to be part of it. Quite clear. Um, Elena Dynas has a question, and she says, "What will be the next breakthrough in astronomy?" Aha, you know what? This is the beauty. I can predict anything. I will be wrong because maybe it's tomorrow. There's something which is getting ready to go out tomorrow. So, of course, I can identify the big stuff, the big facilities. We, I don't know. I think uh, you never know. I think surprise is at the corner. and uh, You have to just open your mind. You have to go a little bit out of your comfort zone. You have to do your own way. And who knows? With a bit of luck, uh, with a bit of imaginations, you're going to make the next breakthrough. So maybe it will be you that is making it. Thank you. Lena, Lena you're listening. You. So, well, <laughs> she is not an astronomer, but she is a chemist. So that's, but still, I think chemistry and astronomy are uh, well, fertile well, ground, I think. Well, uh, so. let, let me clarify that. I, I qualify anything which is building knowledge. I, and then also, I I'm very inclusive. I consider that People studying society, the psychology, all this is exactly part of the same game. I don't see any difference. Whether we do a bit more mathematics, it doesn't mean we are better than the other. It's just about knowledge. So it's a knowledge-based activity when we're building knowledge. And hopefully some of this knowledge is useful. And then we have a, a couple of questions from uh, a person called Gleco O. Um, and I, I'm going to read two of them, and you can pick which one you want to answer. Uh, the, the first one is, did you expect to win, to win the Nobel Prize? And the second one is, which astrological sign are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's easy. I mean, you have to find out by yourself my astrological sign, because you, you Google and you will, you will see <laughs> what is exactly my, my birth date. So you will find out. <laughs> you will not get the decan, but you will get the rest. So that's it's good enough for what it is useful for. So that's good enough. So, uh, if I thought I'd get the Nobel Prize, well, you know, I mean, when you make a big discovery, um, people keep telling you you will have the Nobel Prize, but but it, it doesn't make any sense to believe you get the Nobel Prize, and uh, it may it may not. Of course, I was aware that I was part of the people that being proposed, but. Considering there is hundreds of people being proposed and there's only one prize every year, your chance you will get it is very slim. So when I got it, I was in shock. <laughs> the chance is still a lot larger than finding life on another planet, though. Uh, so. <laughs> who knows, who knows? <laughs> um, another question uh, we, we have asked uh, many of your predecessors uh, and on this show is uh, what advice do you have for young researchers? hoping to find that place in scientific research? Uh. Oh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because I quite often got this question. It seems that because I'm successful into science, I have all the answers. Actually, I don't really know. I can only tell you what I did. I never worries about my future. Despite I had a family, I always thought I would just make a living. I will always make up and find ways uh, to, make, to make a living. I've been playing with my emotions. So it means I have really done what I wanted to do at any time. It means that sometimes I have pushed back some perspective because I thought at that time it would be better for me to do that. I'm talking about my family here because there's a time when I had to take care of quite a lot of my families for personal reason. And at that time of my life, for quite five years about, I decided to slow down my research because I really wanted to do that. That was very important for me. And, and after I decided to be a kind of different topic of research, to expand, to expose myself to new topic. And you see, and then, I mean, again, 
if you do things with you with your heart and with your soul, I mean, you can't you can fail. You would be anyway successful, but you have to, read, to be ready that there will be a lot of failures because life is full of failures. You fail many times, but the fact you fail many times doesn't mean you have to fail forever. And if you still believe what you're doing, you will be successful at the end. So that's my only advice and live the life that you really want to feel you want to live. And that, that's certainly the best way to, uh, to, to try to live with all the hiccups you will have to go through because it would not be easy every day, I can tell you, whatever you do. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's very strong advice. I think uh, that intrinsic motivation uh, and, and fun uh, will, help, uh, will help a lot, I think. Uh, yeah. um, another question um, that we have is, um, every scientist has individuals who are important to their career. Um, how did that work for you? Uh, who was uh, sort of especially important for you to, to help you develop as a scientist and develop your career? Well, that's clear that you encounter um, um, a couple of people and you realize that, well, not all the people you meet are really useful or good people, but there is an amazing, a very good people. And there are a lot of people that are very generous with you. So, so it's very easy for a scientist to meet people with more experience that are willing to help you, to give you advice, and, and just listen to this advice. You don't have to follow the advice and listen. Oh, that's true that in my life, in the course of my career, I've met quite substantial amount of people and I've received quite a lot of advice. Of course, there are some people that you stay quite long with and when your PhD advisor, I always said, how do you pick a PhD advisor? I always say the same, never pick the topic. Pick the guy because you're going to live with the advisor for four years. It's, it's like being a couple. So you better have the right guy and you don't worry about the topic. You will make it good anyway. So I, people are a bit shocked sometimes because they thought about exactly what they have to do to be successful. I say it doesn't matter. Just pick the right guy. You feel that you connect and you can really work with. And, and in, along with your work and when you will do your, post, your postdoctoral experience, you will be going abroad, visiting. You will meet other people and, and try really to to see with some people, they are they good for you, and 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 you can really engage uh, with really discussions and getting some advice and see a way they work. Sometimes they think a different way, and 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 I've had a couple of people like that, and I think this whole science works. And science works to a point with by 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 reading papers and reading books, but there's a limit to that. At some point, you have to put your hand into the system and you have to talk to the people. That's the way that you really sense the edge of the science. So. Don't be shy. And most of these people, they will be very nice with you. So it's very rare that the people you will encounter that will be bad. There will be some. I think they are pretty rare in the business, I would say. I rarely met bad people. Thank you, Didier. That was, uh, I, I think, a very nice um, advice and also a natural ending, I think, because we are reaching the end of uh, our yep. time. Um, I think it's very important what you say. I think. Uh, um, communication is very important and I'm super glad that you, you joined us tonight to discuss your passion for science and explain a little bit on how you actually discover these, uh, these planets and how you see this diversity in the, in the planetary world. Uh, I very much hope that uh, um, in-person discussions will become possible as well. So let's hope that we have a chance to meet uh, maybe in the fall at the Simons uh, meeting in New York. Yeah, uh, when yeah, we hopefully can go, uh, get together again. Uh, uh, but for now, this was, uh, was really a, a wonderful evening. Uh, one little footnote for the people who are watching. Um, it is very important to pick the right guy for your PhD, but it can be a girl as well, so don't worry. Yeah. Oh, when so I say guy, a, guy, guy, it's, it's that's a gender perfectly fine. Oh, so in perfectly in gender neutral. Guy is that's gen, it. It's a gender neutral. Very good, guy. very good. That, yeah, that, you, can that's, check, <laughs> you can check on the book. That's <laughs> excellent. Very careful at that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, DJ. Thank you so much. Um, I, I would like to um, thank all our uh, um, um, uh, audience online uh, tonight as well. Um, it's, uh, I feel a little bit sad because it's the final uh, episode of the first season. Uh, I mentioned first season because uh, we are very excited of having organized this uh, and uh, we are thinking about uh, the next season already to see how we're going to do it. It's uh, maybe post-corona time, so we'll uh, change the format a little bit, uh, but um, has been really fun to, uh, to organize. Uh, I hope you enjoyed watching it uh, and uh, see you back in, uh, in September. Uh, uh, thank you all. And of course, thank you for uh, all the people behind the scenes who made it possible. Uh,
Thank you.